Let the Bible Speak with your evangelist, Ronnie Wade. Jesus and his glory, oh, Jesus and his love. Mm-hmm. Greetings. Welcome again to our program, Let the Bible Speak. As its name suggests, we're letting the Bible speak about the important and challenging themes of our day. We hope that you enjoy our messages, and we hope that they're a blessing to your heart. Today, we're beginning a series of sermons on the church, the New Testament church. Our reading will be taken from the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew, beginning with verse 13 and continuing through verse 20. It was here, if you remember, that Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples upon arriving, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They answered and said unto him, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some that you are Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked, But whom say ye that I am? It was the apostle Peter who answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In this particular passage, Jesus promised to build a church. Upon this rock, he said, I will build my church. You will notice, first of all, that Christ promised to build the church, his church, and that the promise was yet future. Today, we want to talk to you on the theme of what is the church of Christ. When Jesus promised to build the church, what did he promise to build? Before we answer that question, however, here's a song from the Gospel Lamplighters. Sometimes my way seems rough and long, but the road to heaven is the road to home. My trials here will soon be o'er. I see Jesus on the other shore. When we 
ask the question, what is the Church of Christ, we get various answers. There are some who say that the church is an invisible organization existing only in the hearts and minds of men and women, while there are others who claim that such an organization really does not exist but merely is the figment of our imagination. There are many descriptive phrases used in the New Testament scriptures to help us understand exactly what the church is. Today, we would like to notice just a few of these phrases with you. First of all, may we suggest that the Church of Christ is the called out body of Christ. We can learn a great deal about what the church is by learning something about the word church itself. The word in our English language is church. In the Greek language from whence it was translated, it is ekklesia, which literally means to call out or to call forth. Later on, however, it was used with reference to those who had been called out or called forth. They literally were designated or known as a church. We might use an example something like this. Suppose we were to go out today and call some people out of a building. If we call one group from another group, then this latter group constitutes a church in the sense that these people have been called out or in the sense that they have been separated from the previous group with which they were affiliated. Now this is what takes place when we become members of the Lord's church. We are called out of the world. We are called out of a larger group into another group. This group called by the gospel of Jesus Christ constitutes the church of Jesus Christ. The word is used in our Bible in two senses. First of all, universally. When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, he was speaking of the church universal. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul said, for as the husband is the head of the wife, even so Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Again, we have it used in its universal sense. It is also used in a local sense. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of God at Corinth. In other words, he was addressing himself to the Lord's church or to the people of God in that particular locality or city. This constitutes the church local. In any given locality where a group of disciples meet and convene for the purpose of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, we have a local church, a local church of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these local churches together are considered as the universal body of Jesus Christ over which he is head. But now we said that the church of Christ is a called out body of people. Let us notice a little bit about the nature of this calling. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, we are there commanded to show forth the works of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been called forth then from the darkness of sin, the darkness of ignorance and error, into the light of God's eternal truth. Also in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, the apostle said, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called into one body, and be ye thankful. You will notice here that Paul says we are called into one body. I told you that the nature of this calling, or the literal meaning of this word church with reference to this calling, was calling out of a larger group or calling out of one group into another. Now Paul said you've been called into one body. Whereas at one time we existed in this world, a part of the world, we now through the means of the gospel have been called out into one spiritual body. This spiritual body being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul added, and be ye thankful. In other words, we are to be thankful that we've been called out. But we are also to be thankful that we have been called out of the world into one body. Now he did not say, as some people do, be ye thankful for the many bodies that exist or be ye thankful for the many different organizations of a religious nature that exist. 
Sometimes we hear people even thinking for God that there uh, are a multitude that exist or that there are many. But the Apostle Paul said, Be ye thankful that you're called into one body. Then in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. We then are called to be a saint. Now we do not understand the word saint here to represent a special class of people. But to the contrary, it represents all those who have been sanctified and purified by obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is a saint and every saint is a Christian. Anyone who lives up to the teachings of God's word and complies with this standard is rightly so called. How are we called? Or perhaps we should say, by what are we called? The answer to that question is given by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14 when he said, whereunto he called you by our gospel. This calling is not a miraculous calling, nor is it mysterious. It is not something that we receive in the blackness and darkness of night. It is not something that comes to us in a dream or in a vision, but it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that calls us out of sin and that calls us into his marvelous light. That's the reason we can say that the church of Jesus Christ is the called out body of Christ. A group of believers convened and assembled to carry out the commandments of God Almighty. But again, when we ask the question, what is the church of Christ? This time we answer by saying the church of Christ is the household of God. This is the family feature of the church. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, I wrote unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But, and if I tarry, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Perhaps we should pause to notice that the word house many times is used in a figurative sense. That is, to represent the family dwelling within the house. Not necessarily the domestic domicile itself, but rather the people that inhabit the house, the people who live there. Two examples that we might give you are Acts chapter 10 and verse 2. The Bible spoke of Cornelius as being a man who feared God with all of his house, or in other words, with all the members of his family. Again in Acts chapter 16, the story of the Philippian jailer who was converted to Christ the Bible says that upon his being baptized, he rejoiced, he and his house. In other words, there was great rejoicing among all the members of his family. So when Paul said, I wrote and wanted to come unto you, that you may know how you should behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, he's speaking here of God's family. To further attest to that, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, Now therefore ye are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now you will notice he speaks of the household of God. This is God's family. We are now ready for a very, very important point. Listen carefully as we make this point. All of God's children are in his family. To assume otherwise would be to accuse God of immorality. And of course, we would not do that. All of a man's children are in his family. They are a part of his family. They constitute his family. Therefore, all of God's children are in his family. He certainly has no children outside of his family. But according to 1 Timothy 3.15, the family of God is the church of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if all of God's children are in his family, and if the family of God is the church, it logically and scripturally follows that all of God's children are in his church. To be in the church is to be in the family of God. To be out of the church is to be out of the family of God. From that conclusion, there is no reasonable escape. Thus, it is necessary that we become members of God's family, members of of his church. Next, the church of Christ is the body of Christ. When we say that the church of Christ is the Lord's body, 
we are using this term with reference to the organizational makeup of it. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, the Bible teaches us that Christ is the head of the church, which is his body, and that he is the head of the body, which is the church. Then we turn in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, and there we hear Paul as he says, there is one body. Again, in Romans chapter 12, 4 and 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20, the apostle reiterates that truth by declaring that there is but one body, yet in the one body there are many members. Now the case with the spiritual body of Christ is identical to your physical body. While there is but one you and one me, this one me has many members. I have two hands and I have two feet and I have ten fingers. All of these fingers are a part of the one body. Yet the fact that I have two hands does not mean that I have two bodies. Such is the case with Christ. There are many members in the body of Christ, but there is but one spiritual body. To deny that is to deny the truth of God's word. To deny that is to refute what the Apostle Paul said when he said there is one body. We next learn that Christ is the head of this one body. Therefore, as the head of the body, we must be subject to him in all things. The relationship that exists between Christ as the head of the church is one of complete subjection and submission. We as members of the body must subject and submit to his will and to his law. Just as all the members of my physical body are under subjection to my brain or my head, so also are the members of the spiritual body subject to Jesus Christ. Again, the relationship that we sustain to each other as fellow Christians is one of complete unity and harmony. This is accomplished only because we are under the direction of one head. This is because we are working together under his rulership and under his leadership. When we become out of harmony with each other, when it gets to the point that we are crosswise, so to speak, and we're not working together, one of us, or maybe even both of us, are out of harmony, out of tune with our head, Jesus the Christ. But again, what is the Church of Christ? It is the temple of God. It is the place where God meets those people who worship him in spirit and in truth. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 24, the Bible says, In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. God made a promise, and he has been true to that promise through the ages. First of all, because the Jews were a nomadic people and because they traveled from place to place, they constructed a tabernacle. It was easily disassembled and then reassembled again. Then it would be moved to another place. Again, it would be set up and so on. God recorded his name in the tabernacle. He blessed it, and he blessed those people who came there to worship him. Later on, the magnificent temple was built by Solomon. What a wonderful and majestic structure it was. Here again, God recorded his name. And to this place he came and met his people when they assembled to worship him and to pay homage and respect to his great name. Today he has recorded his name in the church. The Bible says in Matthew 18 and verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. Again in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Bible teaches that whatsoever we do in word or deed, we should do all in the name of the Lord. What is this temple? Is it a literal building made with stone, mortar, brick, wood? No, it is a spiritual house according to 1 Corinthians 3, 9, 1 Peter chapter 5, or rather chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. Now, in this spiritual house, we meet to worship God. And as a spiritual house, we meet to worship God. We constitute the family of God. 
We constitute the temple of God. In fact, our body, the Apostle Paul said, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Last of all today, when we ask the question, what is the Church of Christ? We answer, it is the vineyard of the Lord. It is the place where men go to work for Christ. It is a place where they live, where they work, and where they serve as his servants. The parable of the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 8, is worthy of your consideration. While we do not have time to read it in its entirety, may we suggest to you the high points of it. First of all, this man hired laborers into his vineyard early in the morning. Then he went out again and he hired others, and later on in the evening, and finally at 11 o'clock, he hired others, or rather the 11th hour, he hired others. There were still some who were willing to work in the vineyard, and all those who were hired were hired for a penny a day. When the day was completed, the Bible says that the husbandman or the man who owned the vineyard called the laborers, and he paid them one by one. This great parable teaches us much about the kingdom of God. The householder is Christ. The vineyard is the church. The laborers, people like you and me. The reward or the pay, eternal life. The Lord hires laborers, not idlers or bosses. He hires people who go to work. He hires us to labor in his vineyard, not in somebody else's. He hires us to labor in his church, not in some other one. He hires us to labor in his organization, not some other organization. Some people, you know, want to hold down two jobs. They want to work for the Lord, and they want to work for someone else. But the Lord hires laborers into his vineyard. I heard this story one time, and I'll pass it on to you. There was a little boy who lived in a rural community. The announcement was made that the circus was coming to town. He didn't have much money, but he wanted to go to that circus more than anything else. Finally, when it arrived, he went and, and got a job carrying water for the animals and putting the tin in place. He was promised that if he would do this, he could see it free. Finally, at the end of the day, after he'd worked for many hours, the man who owned it sent him home to wash and eat his supper and then come back to enjoy the great show that night. When he returned, the man was nowhere in sight. He couldn't be found. One by one, hundreds of people filed into the great tent to watch the spectacle as it uh, unveiled before their eyes. Finally, the last one had gone in. The little boy walked up to the man who was taking the tickets and he said, Mister, I worked here all day. And the fellow told me that if I would, I could see the show free. The man said, Sonny, I'm sorry, but if you don't have a ticket, I can't let you in. The little boy turned away and brushed a tear from his cheek as he started home, disgusted, disappointed, and dismayed. About that time, there was a man, the man he had been working for, came around the corner of one of the tents. He saw the little boy and he said, Hey, Sonny, come on, it's almost time for the show. And then he pointed to the fellow who was taking tickets and he said, Ed, let this little boy in. He's been working for me all day. Some of these days, the Lord's going to return. And if we ever enjoy the blessings of that wonderful city of God, it will only be because we have been working for him. It will only be because we went to work for him in his moral vineyard in this world. What is the Church of Christ? The Church of Christ is the called out family of God the body of Christ, the temple of God. It is the vineyard of the Lord. Are you in it today? You certainly should be. While you think about that, here's another song. Sing a song, a song of the Lord, working for, working for Jesus our Lord and King. Lift your voice, sing and rejoice, gifts of His Here's what do. Sing for Sing him. Sing for him. Joy will come down. Be alive. Shining so bright. Leading so soul into the narrow place. Praying, praying, praying. Dissonant, holy, 
showing love every day. When you're sad, when you're sad feeling so bad, 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 and when it seems troubles may get you down, when you're blue, when you're blue here's what to do. Here's what to sing for sing him. For him. Trouble come down. When you're sad, when you're sad feeling so bad, 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 and when it seems troubles may get you. To do is what to sing for him, for him, Joe will come down. May we take this opportunity to thank you so very much for being with us today. We're always glad to have you in our audience. We hope that right now you will make plans to be with us next time. As I told you in the beginning, we're starting a series of sermons now on the church. Today we talked about what is the Church of Christ. Next time we're going to be talking about the identity of the New Testament Church. Merely determining what it is does not tell us how to identify it. Now I'm sure that you'll want a copy of today's sermon. You may have it if you'll write to me and just request the sermon, What is the Church of Christ? We're very encouraged that so many of you are taking part in our Bible correspondence course. But we want to encourage others of you to enroll now just as soon as you possibly can. We feel sure that you will enjoy it and definitely feel that you will profit from it. Listen closely now while the announcer gives you the correct address where to write and request these materials. We thank you again for being with us and until next time, may God bless you.